I suppose I was given this topic, the Gnostic Gospel, because in 1992, I wrote the book, The Gnostic Empire Strikes Back. It's the only book of mine that R.C. has endorsed. Indeed, it's the only book he's ever written, uh, read of mine. Uh, <laughs> but that's okay, he still remembers that first lecture. I'd completely forgotten. Um, he was uh, gracious to endorse it. Uh, John MacArthur, I heard, did some sermons on that book. In terms of Mike Horton, he was still in diapers. Uh, but it is a pleasure to share the uh, pulpit with Mike, my colleague from Westminster, and uh, it's good to know that there are younger guys coming up behind us, right? Uh, but what these guys don't know when they were endorsing and preaching about this stuff that, was that that book was born out of culture shock. I taught New Testament in France for 18 years, and of course in Godless France you didn't speak about theology or spirituality in public because everybody was secular. And when I came back to the States in 91, I was amazed to discover that America, that has always been very spiritual, was now changing the focus of its spirituality. And I took some time to try to figure out what was happening. And I'd studied Gnosticism in various places, and I began to connect the dots between what was happening in the culture uh, with ancient Gnosticism. And in that book in 1992, I suggested that all these wildfires that were beginning to spring up in the culture were actually related by a massive fire burning underneath just the surface of the culture that actually connected all the dots together in a new ideology, a new agenda of what I began to call paganism. So these were not so simply hot, unrelated hot button issues but a full-scale alternative to the gospel. Here's what I said in 92. The New Age has a coherent agenda orchestrated from a diabolical center, moving and reproducing ineluctably like algae in a lake. Well, what's happened since 1992? Here's what I want you to take away from this lecture. Gnosticism is both a specific ancient heresy that the church already faced and defeated, but that it is also the essence of the revival of religious paganism, which has the goal of creating a new pagan planetary civilization where the Christian message will be snuffed out if they can do it. That's threatening the church, and that's not new. I lived in France, in fact, in a week's time I will be in Lyon, in central France, and it was there that one of the first great anti-Gnostic church fathers, Irenaeus, was bishop. And just before he got there, the Romans in Lyon put to death 42 Christians in the arena. And what struck me as I visited that place some years ago was this, that the struggle for truth was both inside the church and outside and that Irenaeus and those Christians faithful to the Word of God were fighting Gnosticism, paganism within the church and also outside of the church in the culture around them. And I believe that that is what is happening today and I hope that that perspective will help us as we understand what we're hearing about what is happening in the church that is a reflection on what is happening in the culture at large. So that's what I want you to take away. What about ancient Gnosticism? My New Testament studies set me up for this lecture. While everyone was watching the Allied assault on Germany, I was not doing New Testament studies then, uh, and hoping for a quick end to World War II, an Egyptian peasant by the name of Muhammad Ali was making a stupendous discovery, unearthing in 1945 near the Egyptian village of Nag Hammadi, Gnostic texts that come from the second and third centuries. And you know their message was probably more earth-shaking than the events of the Second World War. Indeed, you could almost say that the war for truth was beginning to work itself out in some kind of very public way in once Christian America from that time on. One of the most influential 
American New Testament scholars, James Robinson, and my own life intersects with all this stuff because he accepted me to do a PhD at Claremont, I didn't eventually do it, was raised on the Westminster Confession of Faith. And he said he made an early exit from orthodoxy. And he was the one who collected together these ancient Gnostic texts and published them. And in his introduction to the Nag Hammadi Library in English, he dismissed the attempt of the church to defend itself against this paganism as describing the bishops as prejudiced and short-sighted. Myopic heresy hunters, he called them. And you know that's still the way liberals try to present us. President Obama, speaking to a group of homosexuals in the White House a few weeks ago, said that those who oppose the homosexual agenda are holding on to, quote, worn arguments and old attitudes. I believe that homosexuality is actually the tip of the spear of this new civilization. And I could give a whole hour's lecture on that, but I don't have the time. I did give one, actually, if you're interested, at the Family Research Council in Washington a couple of weeks ago, and they have, they have that online. So he s opposed the attempt to describe Gnosticism as a, as a heresy, and positively, he suggested that these texts actually were able to explain what was happening in the culture of the 60s and the 70s. He incorrectly argued that those texts had much in common with primitive Christianity, and of course it was argued that the Gospel of Thomas, which was one of those texts, was earlier than all the canonical Gospels. That's not at all true. He said that these texts had much in common with Eastern religions and holy men of all times, thus giving a little push to the growing interfaith movement that was starting in the 60s and the 70s. And this is the interesting thing he says. These texts have much in common with the counterculture movements coming from the 60s. Isn't that most interesting? When the hippies went east and the gurus come west, when they sought to liberate spirituality and sexuality from the boundaries of classic Christianity, these texts arrive, redefining the so-called the nature of Christianity. And it seems to me that what we have actually seen in this very short span of time, in one generation, that the agenda of the hippies on the West Coast have become public policy for the nation at the beginning of the 21st century. In other words, the modern Gnostics like James Robinson and uh, just before him Carl Jung, who was in love with the Gnostic texts and actually the Jung Foundation owned some of these Nag Hammadi texts, saw the value of these texts as fitting the progressive culture that has been developing since the 60s. You know, I want to put what we've heard so wonderfully today in a broader context of what is happening in the culture at large. If you remember what I said about Irenaeus, that there is a sort of a connection between the outside and the inside. And if we don't understand what's happening outside, I fear that we won't truly understand what's happening inside. Well, where do I see modern Gnosticism today? We are living in a time, we are told, of pagan apocalypse, a time of unveiling where this so-called esoteric knowledge is coming out onto the surface and is being made available for everybody. Nobody is embarrassed anymore to call themselves esoteric or even occult. This has become normal spirituality. Peter Berger, the sociologist, speaks of the sacred canopy over a culture. It doesn't mean to say that everyone believes it implicitly, but there was a time when the sacred canopy was the Christian worldview. Now that canopy is being ripped away, and another kind of canopy is being put in its place. That ripping away, the unveiling, the apocalypse, I see in so many ways. For instance, the Jewish Kabbalah used to be reserved only for the mature. Now it's being broadcast all over. The New Age people speak of the dawning of the age of Aquarius. 
The radical witches and feminists speak of the Sophianic millennium, the second coming of the goddess. The spiritual homosexuals predict the coming of eschatological Sodom. And you know, when you realize that between 61 and 75% of the population of the rising generation believes that homosexuality is a perfectly legal and valid lifestyle, you realize that this is not just poppycock. The Masons are going public. In, two, in December 28, 2009, the Grand Master for Pennsylvania said, we need to make Freemasonry more contemporary. 21st century Masonic Renaissance starts today. In other words, what M Masonic thinking really wants to say now is being said clearly, and I found it very clearly said in Dan Brown's latest book, The Lost Symbol, where you find at the end of the book that the symbol that's discovered is the fact, quote, that the ancient mysteries, that is Gnosticism and the Bible, are the same. You see that? There's an attempt to bring all religions together under the rubric of these mystery religions, namely, of course, Gnosticism. Others see the Mayan calendar as decisive for our future. The Christian emergence speak of a deep shift of the great emergence. Apocalyptic Buddhists speak of the coming of Maitreya. Carl Jung, the great Gnostic, had a book, the Red Book, that was kept for 70 years in archives by his family. That has been published this year. It's called the Red Book, and it shows very clearly the paranormal, occultic, shamanistic character of Jungian psychology. But the most telling, it seems to me, of all these movements now up on the surface is what's called the perennial philosophy. It's believed that this perennial philosophy, this, that is to say this philosophy that's always been there, is at the very core of all religions that there is a deep level of, of agreement between all the religions and that it is a subterranean stream that is now appearing on the surface. And what is interesting is that we should have had him speak here actually, it's too bad. The Gnostic Bishop of Los Angeles, why didn't we think of inviting him earlier? <laughs> of the Ecclesia Gnostica of Los Angeles says that the perennial philosophy is another term for Gnosticism, ancient and modern. So very subtly you see, ancient Gnosticism is back with us as this underground stream of eternal, endless truth about religion. Well, what does this perennial or Gnostic philosophy say? What's its good news? Well, the good news is first of all the good news about God. God is the father of the totalities, that is, he is the all, and God joins the opposites. You notice the title of the book I'm bringing out, One or Two. You don't join the, everything into one, and you need to see a world of difference. Well, the God of Gnosticism, ancient and modern, wants to join the opposites. Often revealed in female form as Sophia, as the goddess, he, she, slash, states, I am androgynous. I am both mother and father, since I copulate with myself. This seeks to express the divine mystery of everything finally being one, everything joined together. Everything emanates from this divine spirit, and emanate is a term in the Gnostic text and is crucial because God doesn't create anything because true existence cannot be created, and if you're a Gnostic, you have this true creation, uh, creational existence. As Harold Bloom said, who became a Gnostic, he's professor of Shakespeare at, uh, at Yale University, when he became a Gnostic, he said, I am eternal as old, uncreated, as old as God. You see, that is the seduction of Gnosticism. It is the experience of coming to realize somehow with some kind of technique that you are as old as God, uncreated. In the Gospel of Thomas, which is supposed to be the most Christian, you have this pantheism. 
It is I who am the all, says Jesus. Split a piece of wood and I am there. Lift up a stone and you will find me there. Rendering understandable what one of the great experts, Kurt Rudolph, said about Gnosticism, that it is dualism on a monistic background. Isn't that interesting? We always think of it in terms of, you know, the spirit and flesh and that there is this big separation, which is true. But at the same time, it espouses the whole of reality and is just one more form of monism or what I'm calling more and more, for simplicity, one-ism. So oneistic pagan pantheism is at the heart of this kind of Gnosticism, ancient and modern. Hippolytus, one of the church fathers, noted this connection a long time ago. He documented that the so-called Christian Gnostics of his day, of the third century, were interfaith perennialists who sought, quote, the wisdom of the pagans. That's what liberals have always done. They seek the wisdom of the pagans. The Christian Gnostics, he said, attended the ceremonies of the Isip worshiping mystery cults in order, I love this statement, in order to understand the universal mystery, the perennial philosophy that flows just under the surface, that allows us to see the truth about everything. So that's the true God. The true God is that spirit behind everything who brings the good news to his followers that we are divine like him. The false god of Gnosticism is the creator of heaven and earth. He's called a blind fool and a joke because he thinks, quote, that he is the true and living God. He says, I am God and beside me there is no other, the text you cited last night. That is dismissed by the Gnostics as God being totally ignorant of what is actually there behind him. He doesn't know this and so he is a joke. He doesn't know that the goddess, Sophia, is the mother of the universe. And because of his dastardly work, he is actually called the devil himself and is cast into hell as any devil worth his salt should be by the goddess. These are in the Gnostic texts. So what is Gnosticism? It is, I believe, a Christianized or Judaized form of paganism that's always been with us. The one great perennial philosophy. And I bring for proof the statement of an English witch. I love English witches. Um, American witches you can keep, but um, English witches, they're really worthy of being listened to. And this one, Caitlin Matthews is a priestess of Isis. And she says this, Gnosticism serves most admirably as a bridge for paganism to infiltrate Christianity in our time. And she's the one who announces the second coming of the goddess, the Sophianic millennium, the era of the goddess, where all peoples and all faiths will be united together. And of course, at that moment, Yahweh must be silenced. And so, Many radical feminists have attempted to do that. Naomi Goldenberg said in 1979, at the beginning of this movement, we women are going to bring an end to God. We are engaged in the slow execution of Christ and Yahweh. A Lutheran scholar dismissed the creator God of the Bible as, quote, insane, pathologically violent, and suffering from multiple personal disorder. States which are the result of an archaic first century understanding of God as a theistic being. You see, the whole rejection of theism, of God separate from us, of what I call twoism, that there are two kinds of existence in the whole of reality. One is the creator who never has a beginning and everything else is creation, which began when God said at that moment, let there be. And believe me, you are on this side of that moment and everything is. And Al Harold Bloom is on this side of it too. But there is this tremendous rejection today of the notion of God the creator. 
Something we didn't expect, did we, just 20 or 30 years ago, such that in the San Diego Gay Parade a few years ago, I read on a t-shirt, he's your God, they're your rules, you go to hell. You see, totally relativizing what for so long we took as central to everybody's thinking. But you see how radical Gnosticism is. It is the very rejection of theism. It's the very rejection of the idea that God is separate from us. We're all one together. And that means, of course, that when this kind of thinking takes over, you will be public enemy number one. There is an attempt to sort of hide the true notion of Gnosticism. A so-called objective historian, Elaine Pagels, I was with her at Harvard, so my own life intertwines with these people, tried to rehabilitate the Gnostic Christians, arguing, of course, that the patriarchal bishops were attacking the spiritual victims of Gnosticism and proposing Gnosticism as a wider, valid expression of Christianity. And that the Gnostic Gospels were merely complementary to the canonical Gospels. That is total scam. That is a spin zone. I do watch Fox. <laughs> Douglas Greenlees, a modern Gnostic who is not at all a Christian, says this. In its wording, Gnosticism is Christian while its spirit is that of the latest paganism of the West. The two great Gnostic scholars, Hen Jonas and Kurt Rudolph, never saw Gnosticism as Christian. Rudolph says that Gnosticism is an independent world religion and not, should not be narrowly limited to a Christian heresy. It was a parasite, he said, prospering on the soil of the Christian religion. So that's a very quick background of what is Gnosticism. It is a very serious, ancient, and now modern view, spiritual view of existence. And the question is, what's its future? And I've already intimated to you that I think that it has its eye on a planetary civilization. We didn't realize this in the 60s when the hippies were looking for personal mystical enlightenment, but that has become much more than a footnote. We have seen during this period the demise of secularism which has not survived the bringing together of the East and the West. And that this change of joining the East and the West, of Eastern mysticism and Western technology is really the essence of our world today. And in many ways you can understand present politics, but I won't go into that in those terms. But there are some in the vanguard of this new vision of the world, this progressive, cutting edge, new thinking that have said things about the future. Lloyd Gearing, an apostate Presbyterian, yes, we do have some, <laughs> argues that tomorrow's culture will be post-Christian. He, first of all, in the 60s, simply denied the physical resurrection. And the New Zealand Presbyterians didn't take him to task for it. Now he denies the entirety of the Christian message. And he says this, the time for glorifying the almighty God who supposedly rules is now over. And he predicts that sometime in the future, the calendar will be renamed and the year 2000 will be rechristened as the year 1 GE, global era. The Lord's Supper will be only significant, a significant human fellowship and Christmas will be a family holiday. He says, tomorrow's culture will be religiously pagan. Mother Earth will be the consciously chosen symbol referring to everything about the Earth's ecosystem. And he makes this observation, by the way, his work is being promoted by the Jesus Seminar. It was founded by Robert Funk, Mike, who was raised in a fundamentalistic home. <laughs> and uh, his parents put on him a white suit and white shoes and pushed him out at the age of 10 years of age to preach. Don't do that to your kids. 
Anyway, his books uh, are being promoted by the Jesus Seminar. He says then that the loving care of Mother Earth is in many quarters replacing the former sense of obedience to the Heavenly Father. That's just one of these thinkers. A, a crucial man to know is Thomas Berry, an ex-Roman Catholic priest who just died a year or so ago, calls himself a geologian. And he is at the head of a cohort of Western intellectuals closely identified with the United Nations, seeking to transform our planet into a, a world that worships at the feet of Mother Nature. His best-selling book, The Great Work, has as its goal to, quote, reinvent the human at the species level. This term, The Great Work, intrigued me, and I did a little bit of research, and I discovered that actually this book that is a bestseller and everybody reads it, and it's, you know, um, a, a programmatic statement of what the future world will be. But the title itself is interesting because you find the phrase, The Great Work, in all the occult books uh, of the past. Theosophist Alice Bailey, who actually put great store in the United Nations for bringing the world together spiritually, called that view the great work. Alistair Crowley, another occultist, said the great work is the uniting of opposites, the uniting of the soul with God, of the microcosm with the macrocosm, of the female with the male, of the ego with the non-ego. And in his Gnostic Mass, this is what he said, the priest says, the Lord will bring you to the accomplishment of your true wills, the great work. The great work then is something that is out there and appears to be oh, ecological and um, interplanetary and so on, planetary, but behind it is this occultic spirituality. Thomas Berry's writing lays out a blueprint for a whole new civilization, a powerful origin story, which is not the origin story of the Bible, but is based upon mythical evolution, a powerful pagan spirituality, a philosophical sophistication based on quantum physics, committed to ecology, working out a new pansexuality and a new ethic a this-worldly eschatology, a new psychology, transpersonal neo-Jungian psychology, which is basically reintroducing the world to shamanism, a geopolitical program, a new educational philosophy, a new legal theory. That, I believe, is the future. And it behoves us to realize that the opposition ahead of us is massive and extremely intelligent and determined to work out this theory and bring it into practice. But there's one scholar I want you to note more than any other. His name is Ken Wilber. Into this triumphalist spirituality steps a new Gnostic prophet by the name of Ken Wilber, who wrote a book in 2001 entitled A Theory of Everything, an integral vision for business, politics, science, and spirituality. The new term, by the way, so that you don't look silly, is not new age, but integral spirituality or progressive spirituality. These people don't like the new age people because they were so focused on themselves, you see, because their agenda is now worldwide and they don't want to be identified with some little small group anymore. So integral spirituality is at the head of this big push Wilbur uh, asks the question and tries to answer it, how can everyone be right? And he tries to show that everybody is right. And he's produced a massive philosophy based on that. The universe is not winding down, it's winding up. And a new meta-narrative of deep religion with global consciousness will descend on a collective humanity. His system is based on what he calls holons. That is to say, everything is a whole. But as a holon, it can be uh, integrated into another whole, and so you can build a holistic system by transcending and including. That's the term. You, you, you include something by transcending it. 
And so he lays out a whole transformation of human thinking. He has nine phases. Uh, he calls the first six phases first-tier thinking. Archaic, magical, power gods, mythic order. That, by the way, is theism, number four. Scientific achievement is number five. The sensitive self is number six. Then you move to what he calls second-tier consciousness. And he and all his cohorts occupy phase seven, the integrative, followed by the universal holistic, and ultimately the integral holonic. You following me? Uh, but believe me, this is not fooling around. This man is read by anybody who's anybody. It's Gnostic because the ultimate goal is integral spirituality, which is the direct spiritual experience of everything joined into one. I said this is not fooling around because he is being read right now by Bill Clinton, Al Gore, Tony Blair, George Bush, Jeb Bush, Gerard Schroeder, Tabo Mabiki, Jim Garrison of the State of the World Forum, Michael Lerner of Tikkum, Deepak Chopra, oh, this is a good one, Rajendra Pachauri, who is head of the United Nations IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They're working on his getting his integral theories into climate change. His work is being read at DEVOS, the World Economic Forum, at the United Nations, and at UNICEF. They're developing institutes throughout the world of integral business, integral medicine, integral education, integral psychology. But his goal is staggering. Listen to this. Politically, this is what he wants to happen. The U.S. Constitution was the culmination of first-tier governance philosophy. First-tier means non-mystical. What the world now needs is the first genuinely second-tier or mystical form of political philosophy. We are awaiting the new global founding fathers and mothers who will frame an integral system of governance. You see, this is church and state totally collapsed into one. Well, how is this stuff doing? Transcend and include, I hear said by a number of evangelicals. Some of them now call themselves ex-evangelicals. Tim King was interviewed by Spencer Burke, host of the OozeTV.com. Believe me, lots of young people watch this stuff and are onto these websites. And uh, neither of them, uh, Spencer Burke thinks he's a progressive evangelical still, but they've rejected doomsday scenarios of the Bible. And they agree together to meet beyond our belief systems. We need to transcend by the help of the Spirit and include all the religions. You know, more, the more I read in this material, the more I see that there are two things identifying this upbeat view of a new civilization. Listen to them. The first is interfaith mysticism, and the second is social justice ideology. Those two things are driving the foul, powerful forces of occult spirituality in our day. Let me give you some proof of that. One example is someone I already mentioned, the Lucis Trust of Alice Bailey. It used to be called the Lucifer Trust, but some folks from Ligonier got in touch with them and said, we did well promoting Ligonier, and you'd better change your name too. That was a joke, folks. Loosen up. <laughs> the Lucifer Trust, now known as the Lucis Trust, has been in charge of the meditation room of the United Nations ever since its founding. It still is. Its goal is to bring all religions and nations together. And the literature I get now tells me it should be easy since, quote, uniformity of beliefs is unnecessary. What's necessary? A shared spiritual experience and collective service. You see that? A shared spiritual experience and collective service, namely mysticism and social justice. 
So you have this Tim King, this ex-evangelical saying, let us meet beyond our belief systems. You have the Lucis Trust saying uniformity of beliefs is unnecessary. And you have Harvey Cox in the book that Mike mentioned saying, in this age, doctrines are giving way to social justice and spiritual experience. This is a massive movement, folks. And it is driving itself through our culture under the guise of doing good. This, I believe, is the new liberal agenda. Al Mohler, whom I respect deeply, said one thing wrong in August of 2008. He declared that the liberal Protestant river has run, run dry. Actually, I see a new stream of life now flowing in it. It's this progressive Christianity that is catching on to a pagan reordering of our life in a new form. And the example I give is the Reverend Dr. Lauren Autress, a female priest and canon for special ministry at San Francisco Grace Cathedral, who for a number of years has been popularizing the pagan labyrinth as a spiritual technique. Now, she was a classic secular humanist liberal, denying, you know, all the uh, miracles of the Bible and so on, as the old liberals did. Listen to what she says. We mistakenly thought that the intellect was the avenue of experiencing the sacred, to nourishing the soul. We discounted, discounted the imagination and our other faculties of knowing mystery. You see, the liberals now are turning to what the ancient Gnostics did, to the discovery of the universal mystery of the perennial philosophy. And this, you see, is affecting the evangelical church through a movement that we've been talking about, namely the emergent movement. Not everybody in the emergent movement is this far left, but this is where it's going. Phyllis Tickle prophesies that emergent Christianity will constitute the majority of Christian believers in the year 2050. But just how Christian will these believers be? She says, emergence is bigger than Christianity. It is a major interfaith paradigm shift that will rewrite Christian theology. It is more mystical than anything the church has known for the last 17 or 1800 years. Tickle openly admits that some emergents regard God not as an entity, that is a specific being, but rather that God is a relationship. God is a verb. But this is okay. And so in this movement, on the left at least, we have emergent Muslims, emergent Jews, and if we leave it to Brian McLaren, we'll have emergent Buddhists soon. Here's what one woman pastor of an emergent church the pastor of Journey Church in Dallas, Texas says, you see where this stuff is taking many people who once called themselves evangelicals. I cannot say exactly what we believe, except that experience is, higher, is a higher authority than scripture. I do not believe the Bible is the word of God. I believe Jesus is. Scripture has no hierarchy over other books, it is inspired and inspiring the way a quantum physics book is. This is just amazing that you could read this kind of stuff and still claim to be Christian. Mike talked about Willow Creek yesterday. They've been using books by Richard Raw, a Roman Catholic mystic, who uh, pr promotes non-dual thinking, which is, of course, the classic pagan way of joining the opposites and not making distinctions between us and God. It's ironic. As we speak right now, there is a conference going on at Point Loma Nazarene University, just down there in San Diego, of which James Dobson is an alumnus. And a number of my friends at the church where I attend in Escondido send their children to Point Loma Nazarene University. This conference is going on right now is entitled Nurturing the Prophetic Imagination. And one of my friends went down there yesterday and sent me an email. 
And I just thought it'd be interesting for you to know that in what we always thought was a profoundly evangelical witness, what is actually happening. There is in this conference the goal to deconstruct Christian witness as social justice, but even to declare that private property must be destroyed. It's pure Marxism. There's a de deconstruction of biblical piety. Mysticism is being taught at Point Loma Nazarene College University right now by a PCUS ex-woman pastor who is now a Benedictine nun teaching the mysticism of medieval and modern Roman Catholic mystics. And there is a deconstruction of gender into gender confusion. Five feminist PhD women who teach at Point Loma uh, are seeking to deconstruct the classic forms of the male-female binary and get their students, the males to act as females and the females to act as males. And now they're talking about all the various orientations as being Christian. But finally, the irony is this. Madame Blavatsky, who founded the Theosophical Society from which flowed the Lucis Trust, had her center on the very campus of Point Loma Nazarene University at the end of the 19th century. And you can go and visit some of the buildings there. But one of the speakers said this. She praised the theosophical roots of the campus <laughs> and its importance for the history of San Diego. And nobody said a word. Friends, we're seeing a great apostasy growing like a weed in our modern society. I have five minutes, seven minutes. <laughs> There's one more figure I want to mention, Brian McLaren, bringing Ken Wilber to the evangelical masses. <laughs> He's called Martin Luther by Phyllis Tickle, Charles Darwin by certain liberals, but I think he should no longer be seen as a merely provocative, controversial activist seeking to awaken the church. I think he has adopted radical pagan Gnostic apostasy. His view of God is positively Gnostic. The deity of his evangelical past, who, quote, saves sinners from the fall and punishes unbelievers in hell, is an idol, a damnable fool, idol, sorry, a damnable fool and violent, ugly God. This is just as violent as the language in the Gnostic text I read earlier. He sees the fall just the way the Gnostics did, a childhood lost, an adulthood gain, a journey into maturity. This is a variation of the theme of uh, the Gnostic view of Eve as the heroine who, thanks to this serpent of all knowledge, becomes uh, mature and independent. Kevin DeYoung has rightly said, the spirit of Marcion lives on in Brian McLaren. Marcion was probably the first Gnostic. Where is McLaren hanging his hat these days? He was invited uh, to add his vision of the future. He, by the way, has rejected doom and gloom of the book of Revelation. He doesn't read it. He was invited by the Vision Project to add his vision to a whole series of visions on a website uh, including people like the radical Rianne Eisler, Jean Houston, Barbara Marx Hubbard, Michael Lerner. Uh, one interesting, Sarah McKechnie, who was the president of the Lucis Trust. And all these visions are keyed to synthesis. And McLaren says, I agree with the new vision group and their view based on synthesis. In other words, he agrees that all these different spiritual views will be brought together and bring us, indeed, all together. And how does he get there? Well, he says he gets there with the help of Ken Wilber, of whom he is an avid reader and endorses his books. And so he comes to the position that there is nothing, quote, really distinctive about Christianity. He is quite convinced that the transforming framing story we're imagining could even overflow the bounds of the Christian religion and bring some benefit to other religions and ideologies. In other words, he is, in being 
affected by Wilbur, he's adopting the perennial philosophy of Gnosticism. Wilbur himself, in his books, says that his analysis is a form of the perennial philosophy. He says the notions are the spirit exists, that there is an experience of an enlightenment, a direct experience of the spirit within, which note issues in social action of mercy and compassion. So here you have it, mysticism, experience of the spirit within, and social justice. You know, Ken Wilber's ascending ladder is a scam. Eight of the nine points of transformation are actually pagan, oneist theories of the world. The only one, number four, which he dismisses as having been transcended, which is, a tr which is the Christian faith, is a theistic or tuistic view of existence. That is dismissed to number four, transcended and included. But of course, you cannot join together theism where God is distinct from creation and this uh, monism or oneism where God and the creation are the same. And so you cannot force round pegs into square holes. But that's, you see, where this movement is going. And where I'm going is towards the end. <laughs> because I see in this Gnosticism revived, a revival of actually liberalism. I believe that the first form of liberalism was Gnosticism. Because liberalism is the attempt to take the pagan culture around, transform it by certain Christian terms in order to sell the Christian faith at a cheap price. And we've seen this down the centuries. Jung in the 20th century, a self-confessed Gnostic, introduces Gnostic heresy in so many of the seminaries across the West because he talks about spirituality. He was a Gnostic. Bultmann was in love with the Gnostics and his view helped turn the minds of people like James Robinson and New Testament scholars throughout the Western world. F.C. Bauer, who in the 19th century was the great New Testament scholar everybody followed, including Bultmann, was actually under the influence of Friedrich Hegel, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, which we've always thought to be the arch-rationalist, this man who is seeing the evolution of the world in these powerful terms. And I have a book here that I showed R.C. just a moment ago, entitled Hegel and the Hermetic Tradition, published by Cornell University Press, showing that actually Hegel was a deep believer in Hermeticism, which is a form of ancient Gnosticism. What immense power he had on the world. The medieval church, did you know this? The medieval church was in love with Hermeticism. You had statues of Hermes on cathedrals in the West because Hermeticism, a form of Gnosticism, fitted with the humanistic views of the Renaissance. In other words, liberalism down the centuries has adopted some form of Gnosticism to turn the Christian faith away from the truth. Little wonder Abraham Kuyper in the Stone Lectures said in 19, 1898 that the conflict has always been and will be till the end, Christianity or paganism, the idols or the living God. Today we face a powerful form of Gnostic liberalism, a highly significant group of modern leaders who have rejected secular humanism, identify with this ancient pagan tradition. I found it promoted, for instance, by my future king, Prince Charles, who says this, the teaching of the perennial philosophy is the only way of solving the environmental crises of the 21st century. The Jungian psychologist, Jean June Singer, who actually calls homosexuality the sacrament of monism, says this, that the discovery of the Gnostic texts is, the own, is only the vital opening act to a drama of cosmic proportions. Well, I've discouraged you, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm doing it for a purpose. The time of just hanging around hoping things will get better if we do the same old, same old is over. 
We need to be positive, pos positive, but we need to be realist, as the early church was. I believe that you, and especially your children, are facing opposition that's not been known in the West for hundreds and hundreds of years. And that's why I think the Ligonier Academy and the Masters College and movements like that are doing something significant to train uh, rising generations whose mouths are closed, by the way, because they're so intimidated by this politically correct, all is one, Rodney King, can't we all get along kind of thinking that they're scared to open their mouths. What are we doing to teach them about the essential thinking that has built this so-called politically correct, unified, oneistic kind of thinking? I think our model has to be Daniel and his friends who knew the pagan philosophies better than the magicians and enchanters, 10 times better. That's what we need to be doing in our education of the rising generation of Christians, is helping them to analyze what's happening so that they can bring the truth of the gospel of twoism to a world, buying the lie of oneism. In a week we will celebrate the resurrection. And pagans say, of course, that there is really no such thing as real existence, that's illusion. But all of them one day face death. And you know, the only gospel I know to meet the human situation is the empty tomb. Where God, where God, the creator of matter, will not let it finally rot in the grave, but raise it to newness of life as the first proof of a coming new heavens and earth. Like Daniel and his friends, dens and furnaces might well be part of our witness, but it will be worth it to hear one day the testimony of many pagan neo-Babylonians who, like Nebuchadnezzar, will say, as he said, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just. That was the emperor of the pagan Babylonian empire that said that. Just as the early church defeated Gnosticism, so this neo-Gnosticism will one day meet the truth of God's powerful gospel and be silenced. As the psalmist says, one day all the ends of the earth will fear him. And the final testimony of Nebuchadnezzar will be taken up on the lips of all pagan rulers and nations, past and present, obliged one day to recognize that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.